Good morning and good afternoon to um, all of you who are joining us for this technical workshop on um, green finance for sustainable agriculture and food systems. I am Azeta Tsungu, I'm Rural Finance Officer with the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations based in Rome. As you know, this event is being co-organized by the CAPFIN Partnership and the SAFIN Network. And I think most of you already know um, CAPFIN and SAFIN, but just in a nutshell, if we have colleagues who are joining us for the first time, uh, CAPFIN is a long-standing partnership that brings together um, rural and agricultural finance experts from seven international development agencies with the aim of fostering the agenda for inclusive rural and agricultural finance through creating and sharing knowledge as well as strengthening uh, capacities of their stakeholders. Right now, the uh, member organizations in CAPFIN are the SIGA, the FAO, GIZ, IFAD, uh, the World Food Program, UNCDF, and the World Food Program. SAFIN, on the other hand, is the Smallholders and Agri SMEs Finance and Investment Network. It is a global network of actors that come together with the purpose of building a better functioning financial ecosystem for small and medium enterprises in agriculture and food. Uh, let us, at this opening um, session, give the floor to Adriano Campolina and Arindom Data, who will be saying uh, some welcoming words and addressing the, the workshop participants on behalf of the organizers. Adriano is the team leader of the Rural Institution Services and Empowerment Team in FAO, where the Inclusive Rural Finance Area of Work is housed, and he will be addressing the workshop on behalf of CAPFIN Partnership. Arindom is executive director and head of the rural and head of the rural and development banking and advisory at Rubble Bank. He is also a member of Safin's steering committee, and he will be speaking on behalf of uh, of Safin. So let me now give the floor to Adriano. Uh, the floor is yours to to, to start with the opening. Uh, thank you very much, Azeta, and good afternoon, good morning, uh, and good evening, colleagues. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today uh, and to be part of this important event on green finance for sustainable agricultural practices and food systems on behalf of the CAPFIN partnership. We consider the topic of today's workshop to be of fundamental importance for the pursuit of multiple development goals. As you know, evidence suggests that agricultural development is one of the most powerful tools to achieve the sustainable development goals, including those related to climate change and the environment, to build resilient livelihoods in rural areas, to fostering inclusive growth, reducing poverty and malnutrition, and so much more. In 2013, uh, agriculture accounted for one third of the global GDP. Therefore, it is clear that green in agriculture is central to green the economy and the planet. Even more so, considering that the sector contributes disproportionately to the CO2 emissions and global warming. On the other hand, the green of agriculture cannot achieve our investments uh, are going to the food system stakeholders at the necessary speed uh, and scale and with impact. In reality, despite recent progress, agriculture, uh, agriculture who remains underserved uh, by financial institutions and suffers from underinvestments. This is even more pronounced for certain market segments and sectors such as the smallholder farmers, agri MSMEs, women and youths, and green and sustainable finance. The latter uh, being the focus of the present workshop. I take this opportunity to encourage us to think at how finance can support the shift to environmental sustainability in agriculture and food, but also uh, to more inclusive systems that leave no one behind. Finance is an important cornerstone in the global development agenda and the achievement of SDGs when it makes things happen that are truly sustainable and sound on all three dimensions, including economic, social, and environmental. I believe that the issues addressed in the workshop are truly central to the efforts being made at all levels to advance the case for green and sustainable finance in agriculture and food, but also for improving inclusivity. I would like to single out the role of the enabling conditions, such as policies, regulations, and incentives that we know are of keen importance. And related to this, 
uh, is the catalytic role of the public sector, whether in building the necessary stakeholder capabilities, infrastructures, generating and sharing information and evidence, supporting the development of bankable and inclusive green projects, and working with all stakeholders to make green investments in agriculture and food commercially viable so that more and more private source of capital can be mobilized and resource channeled to environmentally, socially, and economic, economically sound pursuits. I am honored to represent CAPFIN in this meeting. As FAO, we are proud to be a co-founder and contributor to the partnership. We think CAPFIN represents an asset for the inclusive rural and agricultural finance community of practice and a worthy model of interagency cooperation. As a partnership with global relevance, CAPFIN and its member organizations are working closely with partners and stakeholders at all levels. This partnership-based approach helps us to ensure that our work is not only reflective of multiple perspectives and responsive to global priorities and local realities, but also that it is evidence-based and actionable so that joint efforts can translate into results on the ground. Today, we are very happy to co-host this workshop together with our colleagues at SAPI. I would like to conclude by expressing my compliments and appreciation to both teams, CAPFIN and SAFI, uh, for what promised to be a very interesting and engaging event on a topic that's, that's really uh, uh, at, at the top priority for everyone uh, in the sector. Thank you very much. I wish you a very fruitful workshop, and I wish to also uh, encourage all of us to look at this fundamental interdependence between inclusivity and sustainability. Uh, and how uh, we face exactly the same, the same challenge to both uh, uh, sides of this equation. I wish you an excellent workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adriano. Um, Arindom, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Azeta. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants and all the speakers. It's a pleasure for me to address uh, the, uh, this event. Now I'm speaking from New Delhi, which is not only a COVID hotspot, but it's also a climate hotspot here. Now I'll make one general comment about green financing and four specific comments. The general comment is green financing is evolving, it's niche, and the protocols around tax taxonomy standards and measurements are work in progress. So we need to appreciate that, that, you know, it's a long journey ahead and we are uh, you know, undergoing the journey together. Now, the first specific comment I would like to make is on SDG 17 and the relevance of SDG 17. That's about partnerships and collaboration. Since climate is such a complex challenge and financing for solutions which addresses the climate issues as is an even bigger challenge, we require active participation and collaboration of not only the private sector, the public sector, but also the development sector and the community at large. Now, it's easier said than done because the devil is in the details. Now, there are institutional limitations and cultural limitations to such collaborations. And I will stick my neck out with my experience of dealing with multiple stakeholders across the globe that it's more of a cultural bottleneck or cultural limitations that we as institutions cannot work with other sectors. We require champions and I do hope that networks like SAFIN and events like this, it helps us to identify the right kind of champions who can collaborate with other sectors to make green financing happen. That's one. Second, the issue of blended finance. Extremely important because climate risk, when we are talking about businesses, which are addressing the issue of transition or adaptation, these are all very new businesses. And it's not easy always for the mainstream commercial financial providers to understand and to manage those risks and to protect their balance sheet. That's where a lot of non-commercial capital or soft capital is required. Now, this is extremely critical and therein lies the requirement for the development sector, the multilats and the governments and the private sector to work together. The next comment I would like to make, and it's extremely important in my sense because I'm based in Asia, is right now green financing is a niche activity. It's a niche business for a lot of European niche funding agencies, large banks with their specialized services or very niche green funds. 
I would like to see the large retail banks of China, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Brazil to be doing the green financing because that's when green financing is going to get mainstream. So it's a shout out, it's a cry out for the multilats, for the governments and the green funds to work with the large domestic funds because these are the geographies, these are the countries which are facing the maximum climate risk and this is where the action is and this is where we need to unlock local domestic capital, extremely important. Now, the last point I would like to make, and that was already has already been made by Adriano, is about inclusivity. Now, the, 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 the cry for green financing is becoming very shrill. And somehow I do not see the S part of ESG or the inclusivity part being talked of much within green financing. Now that is critical if we are talking of Africa, Latin America and Asia. Now, if you require, if the green financing agencies, they require the buy-in of large communities in Asia and Africa of the governments and local institutions, then the social inclusive piece or the inclusivity piece uh, is extremely important to be not only incorporated well in the green financing uh, you know, initiatives, but also to be talked of so that it becomes very interesting and people would relate to it a lot more. Now, with that, I would like to thank the organizers again, and I wish this event all the very best. And I hope that the CAFIN partnership and the SAFIN network, it expands so that we have the right kind of stakeholders, the, you know, the, the multi-stakeholders across sectors, across continents working together to make this world a more climate friendly place. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Arindom, and thank you, Adriano and, and Arindom, for uh, your interventions and the, for, for the very interesting insights there. Um, now, before starting with the agenda items for today, I would like to take a few minutes to explain that what this workshop is about, what we are aiming at with this, and the process for the coming two days, uh, two afternoons on uh, this side of the world where we are sitting. Um, let me start by reiterating uh, on something that Adriano mentioned in his um, opening remarks earlier on in relation to the importance of agriculture and food systems for the global greening agenda. He said that, amongst other things, he said that the agricultural sector and the food sector, I think, together account for uh, about one third of the world's gross domestic product. That is, of course, quite impressive. If we add to this also the fact that this sector also uses about 60% of the globe's ecosystems and it provides livelihoods for roughly 40% of the, of the world population, it becomes pretty clear that um, for the shift to sustainability, agriculture and food um, are a problem, but also a solution. Um, and I'd like to quote um, an FAO source from 2012, actually, saying that there will be no greening of the economy without agriculture. Now, despite of this compelling need, as you all know, um, upscaling green finance and sustainable finance in the sector has been a little bit of a challenge. Uh, and we know that the reasons are many and the challenges are many. I'm not going to go into this now. Um, in the interest of time, but just to say that a lot of these challenges and gaps are still there and uh, begging and crying to be addressed, despite of the progress that has been made in the more recent years, as a matter of fact. Uh, I just wanted to say that with respect to this, the technical sessions of this workshop have been designed to really go deeper into some of these key challenges, looking at the problems and the issues and the bottlenecks, but also the drivers for change, and also some of the answers and the solutions that are emerging out there. Um, so um, why is it important to upscale uh, green finance for agriculture? If we want to align finance to the real needs of the economy in the long run, we need to upscale green finance and importantly so in agriculture for the reasons that we mentioned earlier on. I think, um, you know, it's very clear that the shift to sustainability, it's a time bound process. We don't have a lot of time as a matter of fact. 
Um, if I'm correct, it was 2018 when the uh, IPPC uh, came out with a statement saying that um, if we wanted to keep the global warming, the, the increase in the temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius within this century, we needed to cut CO2 emissions by 45% by 2030. And we are not talking about a long time down the road, we are talking about really nine years from, from now, basically, not 2030. So it is really about accelerating and scaling up that we should be talking about and we should be to be working on. Um, what we need is to make uh, green investments and sustainable investments in agriculture and food the mainstream, the normal really. And therefore we need green finance to come in, um, to flow in, in at, you know, at, at the right scale and speed basically. Um, and are we really doing that? Are we moving fast enough? Um, what are the hurdles that we have on our way and what is it that needs to be done um, in order to get where we need to, to be going? This is really what this workshop will be um, um, zooming into, uh, talking about. Um, it will look at uh, the key challenges, as I mentioned, and gaps, and it will look at the solutions that are emerging and the innovations. Uh, in these two days, we are going to hear from the experts, we are going to exchange uh, our views, we will be learning from the experiences and the innovations that are taking hold. And we also hope that the workshop will provide us all, including the organizers, Kafin and Safin, and, and, uh, Safin uh, concrete elements, concrete entry points to design, to define our own work agendas going forward uh, in this very important area of work. Now, let us look at the program for these two days. Um, we will start day one today with a presentation that looks at the current state of um, green finance in agriculture and food. Um, it will bring to, to our audience the key findings from a stakeholder, a stake, stock taking exercise a study that is being carried out by CAPFIN uh, in collaboration with APRACA. The, um, Rural and Agricultural Credit Association for Asia and, and, uh, and the Pacific. Um, this will then be followed by um, moderated discussions and interactions with the, um, with the audience. Subsequent sessions then, session two, session three in the following days will be um, building on some of these key issues that are coming out of this take, stock taking exercise. Um, in, uh, Session two, technical session two, we will be focusing on the opportunities and the barriers for upscaling green investments in agriculture and food. Um, that those, uh, those aspects that relate to the role of the public sector, to the ecosystem aspects and the enabling environment. Again, this session is organized around the keynote speaker and then we will have panel, dis panel discussion with selected uh, experts. On day two tomorrow, we will have technical session three that takes us into the realm of innovations and solutions. We will have three parallel sessions there that zero in on specific examples of innovations at product, project, and enabling environment level. Each session will be organized internally um, uh, into you know, presentations and again, moderated discussions. There will be... Uh, reporting back session after that, um, where the key takeaways from each one of these three parallel sessions will be presented so that all participants have a chance to hear to what were the main insights in each one of these sessions, including in those where they could not uh, personally participate. And finally, session, session four is actually dedicated to SAFIN. It's a plan, it's an internal planning session of SAFIN. Uh, to talk about, to discuss about the future work of the network um, in the area of green finance for agriculture and food. This is open to SAFIN members only. Okay, I think we are, with this, we are ready to go for day one. We will start uh, this session with the presentation that I already mentioned on the uh, findings of the stock taking study uh, that is being carried out by CAPFIN and AFRACA. The presentation will uh, covers a lot of ground, but in this particular workshop, we'll mainly go into you know, looking at the trends, innovations, challenges, and remaining gaps that need to be addressed. Our presenter is Mr. Uh, Prasun Kumar Das, who has been working on the preparation of the study. Prasun is the General Secretary of APRACA. 
Our moderator will be Panos Varangis. Uh, Panos is a principal agricultural finance expert with IFC, the International Finance Corporation. He is also an active member of the uh, CAPFIN and an active contributor to the CAPFIN partnership. Um, in the interest of time, of course, as you see, I'm just mentioning the names, titles, and current affiliation of the speakers and various contributors. But so you, for you to know, you can find the rich details, the details on the rich careers and professional um, achievements of, of all our speakers, moderators, panelists, and so on, in the website of uh, SAFIN. There is a dedicated page there. And also in CAPFIN's Rural Finance and Investment Learning Center. We will be sending the links then later on in the chat. So you can go and, and check those out. With this, I would like to invite, I'm hoping I haven't forgotten anything important. Yeah, so I would like to invite the participants when they have comments and questions to ask, please type them in, in the chat. Um, so I would like to invite now Prasoon to start with his presentation. Prasoon is joining us from Bangkok. Thank you so much, Prasoon, for joining us. It's uh, rather late now in, 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 um, in, uh, in Bangkok, I think. Um, and also, I'd like to join to invite Panos to take charge for this session, actually, um, with the presentation of, of, uh, of Prasun. So um, I think with this, Prasun, we are ready to go. If you're ready, we are ready. So you can ready. share the screen. Yes. OK, fantastic. We see you now. Yes. Can you see the presentation, please? Yes, we Hope see you your screen. See the yeah. So, yes, looks see. good. Yeah. Good afternoon uh, from Bangkok and good morning uh, to my colleagues. Thank you, Ajeta, for this uh, generous uh, introduction and uh, an opportunity for me to do, uh, to work on this uh, green finance landscaping study. Uh, on behalf of Praka, we are uh, really uh, happy to you know, support Catherine Partnership. I think we are working with them for the last uh, 10, 15 years. So this, uh, <laughs> the outline of the, I, I will go straight to the outline because we will be very, very, you know, uh, um, uh, you know limiting ourselves on the work we have done. Uh, the introduction, understanding the taxonomy, drivers, global trends, climate finance to agri-food, green finance to agri-food, uh, innovations and findings. There will be some over overlapping of, uh, of the terminologies. Please forgive me for that, as um, Arinda was also telling that we are still in a, the work in process uh, or work in progress for these uh, taxonomical issues. So first, uh, uh, no, there are uh, uh, some pain points which uh, we all know the how this paper came and why why we are interested in this. Uh, the issues are already uh, uh, taken up by by Adiano, by uh, by Arindam, by Ajeta. So I don't want to go into detail, but just a point that uh, we actually agriculture, although it's very important, but at the same time. They are also the greatest cause of the biodiversity and uh, the global greenhouse gas emission. So there are certain uh, no pin pinpoints and the thematic areas, like climate change continues to increase the strain of the global food system. That is also very, very important. And small scale agricultural actors who are 85% of the global uh, no, agricultural business encounter a number of challenges. Everybody knows it. Green finance to agriculture is a subject barriers that have traditionally affected agriculture development finance. And as uh, Pano said a few days back, that it's a double challenge for all of us. So what is the, the now the engagement and action taken by global, global community? Yes, Arinda was telling that we need to have a you know, global community need to take some, uh, some action and we have already taken action. So some of the action already said that some of the investment flows and the gaps have already been considered. And as a study of a POE fund and all these things, they have said that there is a minimum of 105 billion US dollar needed annually for the global adaptation of the climate change to actually you know, support agriculture and food system. 
then the food and land uh, coalition they say that you uh, you know you need us dollar 300 to 350 million for transition towards uh, sustainable food system by 2030 the recent uh, report of ifa along with cpi estimated that there is a you know half a trillion us dollar in 2017 and 18 but the, uh, the uh, uh, but only 10 billion of this actually reached the small farm, which is a very, very, you know, uh, alarming point. Now, the approach of the paper is the starting with the understanding the taxonomy, the landscaping, a global train, innovations, then green finance ecosystem, policy regulation impacts, and then we go to the conclusion and the next steps. So coming to the understanding of taxonomy, what we found that there are four major terminology uh, which are coming into the into the wave, which is sustainable finance, green finance, and climate for climate finance, and then finally we come to the green finance to agriculture. The first three, sustainable finance, green finance, and climate finance, have somehow already been you know, developed and already been you not. Know, uh, but defined by many of the organizations, uh, but green finance for agriculture need to be you know, uh, further refined and defined. But recently, of late, there is a development we call it the inclusive green finance, which will have the, the uh, this terminology is being used by ZIZ and AFI very very often now. And then it is basically it's a it's a uh, it's a coming into a kind of you know where you have a national strategy uh, which will be covering uh, not only not only agriculture but environmental health social social and economic effects of the climate change. So these are the these are the areas. But what I say that these are all nested uh, you know uh, definitions. So we need to understand that uh, it's all listed and we have to we have to define it differently or maybe maybe we have to come to a conclusion that these are the real definition. Now coming to the drivers of green finance. See we when we go to the uh, green global green finance index value of 2021, what we found, that the policy and regulatory framework is the most important driver, not the loss of biodiversity, not the food security or the water quality, but it is the policy and regulatory framework. Then it comes the investor side, the demand side, the investors demand. It is not the, not the, uh, not the uh, demand side, actually, it's the supply side, basically. And then comes the third is the climate change. Public awareness is also very important in terms of the uh, driver and the, with the index value. So coming to the uh, green finance instruments, some generic instruments are already, I tried to put here some of the generic instruments, but a major issue I was also discussing with yourself on that, that we, well, whether we are actually don't need to define asset class, whether land is an asset class or already it's an asset class and how, under the climate uh, change uh, scenario and in agricultural finance, how we can define uh, 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 agricultural land as an asset class and put it where. So there are debt instruments, equity, debt plus equity, credit enhancement instruments. All of us know that then there are these transfers. But what actually though, know, what actually I, I wanted to drive home here is the financial instruments available under the common agricultural policy. We don't have to do, uh, go for a rocket science, but we can also find out what is available at a, you know, at a country level, at a national level, and which a significant potential in contributing to the achievement to the Green Deal ambition, and more specifically to the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies across the continents. So this is very important uh, message I want to give that uh, it is uh, nothing to do with uh, no huge amount of you no know, work and all, which we have. We have, uh, we have the instruments available at a national level or at a sub-regional sub level. We have to only use those, uh, those, uh, those uh, instruments. Now coming to the global trends in green finance. So I'm, I'm still in the general green finance, how it is working. See, if we go to the, uh, there is a Bloomberg study, what uh, it's saying that global sustainable date annual issuance. If you go to that, you will see the green loans is really very very small amount whereas the sustainably the green bonds are in huge they, they are the major that they are actually ruling 
uh, the whole bet instrument. And when we, when we uh, go to the World Bank uh, you know, green uh, bond, we found that agriculture is uh, uh, the uh, agriculture land use and forest ecological resources, 17%, which uh, it, it, it's, itself is very huge amount in that way. That if the, if the green bonds are going to 17% of the issuance of green bond by World Bank is going to the uh, going to uh, you know, agriculture and land use, it is it is really a huge amount. But at the same time, we have also considered that there are some of the you know, um, additional uh, areas which actually also supporting, for example, the water uh, management and wastewater management. All are basically somehow related to the support services to agriculture. So it's not that ag green bonds are only skewed towards uh, towards the uh, uh, the uh, energy or other things, but there are uh, the green bonds which are also supporting agriculture. Now the green finance ecosystem. I tried to develop a you know, a, a, uh, no, um, a drawing where I I try to find out who are the actually uh, uh, the partner in the ecosystem. And in the top, if you can see that the public support mechanism, and at the end there is a green finance escalators. So I'm uh, and you, you know all this public sector cost cutting and private sectors are all there, but I would like to you know focus here on the green finance escalators. So we what we found that there are four types of escalators. As um, I think I, I I fully agree what Arindam said. One is the innovation incubators. The second escalator networks and association like Caffeine, uh, Safin, even, even a smaller a regional network like us, we can also be a green finance escalator. Then the research and advisory services, science. Science is important. We have to, we have to understand science also and relate it. Uh, uh, and then the international cooperation. So these are the four green finance escalators. I think these are areas where we need to focus more. Then coming to the global architecture, who are the actors? Who are, I mean, there are multiple actors as uh, uh, Diano also said, and everybody will act, uh, accept this. But I tried to put it in uh, three different uh, parameters. One is the domestic public finance. Then international public finance, and finally the private finance. As uh, 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 we all agree that uh, public finance actually can be leveraged to bring the uh, private finance, which is which is a common uh, to all, not only for agriculture but for all other sectors, even in the infrastructures. So, what are the domestic public finance? We are actually, you know, we uh, we we work uh, you know closely with Safin and Ifad on on the public development banks. And what we found that public development banks are very much interested, but only thing is that they have to be they have to bring into the common platform, which we are actually you know, missing uh, the public development bank since last you know, few years. And uh, they were uh, only working with the national level uh, financial institution. So here, national, sub-national budgetary uh, situation, we have to see, like for example, ASEAN in, in, as a sub-regional uh, you know, uh, organization, they have a huge budget on the climate, uh, you know, uh, how to support the climate change in agriculture. But how, how this uh, budget can be utilized? Then the sectoral budgets and their taxes, subsidies, bonds, fees, and domestic uh, you know, climate change funds. So many of the countries do have the domestic climate change funds, uh, 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 for example, in China, for, uh, in Brazil. So all of them do have the uh, domestic uh, you know, climate change fund, and the public development banks can utilize it very well. Then we have bilaterals, we have multilaterals, then we have the funds under UNFCC, MBBs, other funds. So there are many that coming to the private finance, they are also very important uh, you know, player. The private enterprises, they are uh, actually, you know, uh, are in the most telling that there are many European uh, private enterprise, you know, endowment funds or you know, angel investors are coming up with, uh, with, uh, with their foundations, so these are these are very important element in the whole uh, you know, uh, architecture. Then the private financiers are also their commercial bank, like big banks and you know uh, some insurance companies, investment funds are there. Uh, public private partnership as a very important instrument. We'd like to flag that. 
then the insulin system to uh, to uh, uh, manage the risk and definitely the venture capitals which i think most of our you know uh, staff in members they do have the venture capitals some of them do have in a big way so we we, we are actually you know, uh, you know uh, uh, requesting all of them to you know come and you know, join this global architecture and uh, and uh, go, you know, go, uh, support this green finance coming to the climate uh, smart uh, uh, you know finance to climate finance to agri food sector so there is a study uh, of uh, there was a study uh, made in uh, 2016 by FAO. They have given some promising avenues and uh, potential pathways. Actually, you know, all of us knows all these things, but this is just uh, you know providing it in one place that designing an innovative mechanism, which all of us know that this is very important. But leveraging additional sources for capital is important here. Then identifying entry points is very important in a value chain. Entry points actually, you know, asking you the major, uh, you know, uh, research that who, what are the entry points? Why, when we, we uh, when uh, the organization is mature uh, to enter into this type of, you know, uh, new ventures and providing the technical assistance, which is a part of, uh, you know, all the uh, MDBs and also also the also the IFIs, then. We have a little bit of a breakdown what we have received from uh, CPI. What we found here that the public actors are basically you know, very, very active. What we have the idea that public actors are not so active. But at the same time, as we see, the leveraging ratios are really not so high. It's only, let's say, 1.18 times or 1.5 times. So we need a higher leveraging ratio to let's say five to six times, which we see, we, we could saw we could see in 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 any any uh, you no know, enhancement uh, structure. When we talk about any enhancement uh, you no know, instrument, we see uh, the leveraging at a ratio of one is to ten. For example, in the credit guarantee program across the globe. So this is very important message that there are uh, no activities coming up from the private actors but leveraging ratio is really low. Then coming to the climate finance and smallholder farmers. It's a, it's a very, very interesting study made by uh, IFA uh, with uh, CPI. And they said only 1.7% of the global climate finance goes to the small scale farmers, which is really uh, no, uh, uh, no very alarming for all of us. Then uh, another is the investment opportunity. If we see the investment opportunity, there's a market value of sustainable agriculture to the tune of 872 billion globally, but which is you no know, only uh, you no know, 32 point, which is which is growing in a very you no know, huge uh, uh, growth rate. But we are, are we are we matching with that? So that's a, that's a question we should ask ourselves and we should ask the global community. Then uh, green finance to agri food sector. So there is a you know, wider agenda for the green financial system, developing green financial system in agri food sector, which is building on the resilience of agriculture uh, is uh, critical. We have seen it that in the COVID all situation also, that agriculture is the only sector which has given its full potential. And then basic performance, integrity, and reach of the financial system. The third one is the regulating informal financial service providers. That is also very, very important because they are actually in agriculture, uh, they are you know, uh, controlling around uh, 40 to 50% of the whole market. And then provide long-term finance to the infrastructure, which is very important and public development bank come, picture, come into picture here. Optimizing the policies and incentive structures. That's a, that's a big, uh, big question of debates of how how we can use the uh, the carrot and stick uh, you no know, methods here uh, that how the incentive can work then using the public finance effectively to leverage private finance as I already said in the last uh, slide then there is a, a study again by FAO in 2018 which says that in a GCF project for a period of two and a half years which is full you know in the book uh, in the in the paper it is uh, uh, it is further detailed that only 12 percent has been going are is going to agriculture sector primarily agriculture sector then 
if you see majority of the gcf project are non agricultural project which is 52% so these are this is what actually now we have we have in this as in our plan so now we have to change the matrix how we will do it so there is a supply side and the demand side in the supply side i start with the supply side although i mean most of us are coming from the supply side traditional agriculture finds are already extremely challenging as uh, panos was telling that when you talk about a green a green finance it is a double challenge so agriculture is already challenged and then again account uh, green finance to agriculture another challenge so it's a double challenge then limited knowledge on the green finance to agricultural development for all of us it's a, it's a you know, new area as why as I, I i know about the story of the elephant where, which portion you are talking about then inadequate alternative collateral i'm talking about here the regulations the infrastructure etc then coming to the demand side which actually who will be the issue here the reasons for the slow move or slow pace of adaptation to climate and natural hazard we, we try to understand but we are still though in a process the last 20 years we are still understanding why actually we are halted faltering then the good agriculture practice is affected by a range of uncontrollable factors which in a developing country or even even for the uh, no uh, island countries it's a very very difficult uh, situation there are many uncontrollable uh, factors policy environment natural endowments and all uh, for example in nepal we do not have you know, major area for uh, finance uh, i mean uh, uh, agriculture they have ma majority area is in the mountain so low level of awareness about the green finance problems then coming to the innovation so we try to make a you know four level of innovation which may uh, support uh, green finance in future one is the innovation in the green finance delivery instruments and the good practices so i'm not telling here the best practices but uh, the, uh, intentionally the term is good practices green finance delivery instrument one of them as Uh, arinda was talking about was also telling is the blended finance definitely it will have a long term impact in future so we we will be we will be more working on the blended finance the innovative mechanism in green finance for example green equity investment funds so uh, there are uh, green equity investment funds in some of the countries but they are not mature enough to support this green finance to agri food sector then the second level of innovation the policies and enabler to green finance is very important that if you have a good you no know, uh, enabling environment and innovative uh, enabling environment that will help so innovative policies adopted by the central banking system some of them are fiscal incentive for example in asia we have bank uh, bangladesh bank they have already started this uh, fiscal incentive to many of the uh, of the financial institutions if they are uh supporting this uh, uh green financial uh you no know, uh, to to support the green finance in the country uh, there are many others also i i may not have all the example but they are in the in the paper it is there then policy measures at the financial sector so this is also important the ecosystemic support to save the investments in uh, uh climate mitigation undertaken by the clusters of the emerging farms so that is that is that might be that might be very very you know you can say we can we can calculate or we can monetize then the sec third one is a technology enabled innovations in green finance i'm not talking about digitization here as such but innovative digital finance for example blockchain in climate risk crop insurance there are some good example where blockchains are being used for climate risk crop insurance so which is which is a technological then climate smart lending platforms so many of our, even even some of the safin members they have a, they created the platform for the smes or agri smes uh, to they are all basically the climate smart lending platforms so we have to we have to you know, encourage them then promotion of innovative green technology agri smes as an opportunity to promote financial de risking so these are these are the technology uh, uh, part of the innovation and finally the innovative risk proofing techniques in green finance redefining the risk management in green finance risk risk sharing facilities such as partial guarantee not a full guarantee program but a partial guarantee 
I mean, what I said, it, it's not a final one. We can have a discussion on that. Then integrated approach for physical risk assessment, which is ESG rating reporting standards. Now coming to the policies, I, I think we have we have talked about a uh, lot of policies there, but uh, I want to say like there are macroeconomic enabling green investments which are full in uh, available in the in the paper. Then regulation guidelines are there, international international regulation, international guidelines, international initiatives, uh, and initiative from the financial institutions. Then what we need, we need a policy promoting flow of private capital in green finance definitely for agriculture. Enablers for institutional investors in greening the agri-food sector. Broad policy areas to support. Then engagement of stakeholders for demand and supply side. Then we have a, uh, a stakeholders engagement as we, as I always say that we have a very important uh, you know, uh, player which are the central banks. We have to keep the central banks in, in, in our forum in our all discussions and in the conversation to bring them into the platform for uh, providing them with a lot of this kind of you know knowledge and uh, sharing the knowledge with them, which will support, which will help the other financial institutions. Then key findings, we have some findings on the issues and challenges and some findings on the enablers and drivers. So some of the issues, uh, as I said, common definition is a common issue. Nationally determined contribution, they are Actually, there is no sub-target for provisioning on green finance, but these indices are very important for a country. Um, then skewed clean energy uh, development in case of uh, green finance. Then dealing with the downstream. Agri food sector investment is purely dealing with the uh, downstream or upstream agricultural operation. Then innovation in agri-food, some, the, some of them seems to be generic, but it is all, all of them are very, very important in, uh, in, in defining the, uh, uh, the green finance in the future. Then hurdles in designing commercially viable agri resilience investment project, which we call it as a you know, bankable. Then lack of policy level commitments. I, 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 I'm not going into the detail of this, might be some you know, uh, political uh, commitments, also some you know, uh, socio-economic commitments are all, all should be there. Then enablers, knowledge-based collaboration, plugging the multifacet, please, policy environment, innovative, tailor-made, green financial instrument, instrument for financing, climate smart agriculture, national, regional, and global network, which we are now working, uh, we, we, are, we are on that. Then recommendations, we have six kinds of recommendations here are the intensive policy level engagement, which is matching with what is the uh, finding out. Then setting medium and long-term priorities for the green finance to agri-food sector. We do not have right now, which we, we need to do along with the NDCs. Then promote regional and international cooperation, which we are trying to do. Then scaled up engagement at financial institutional level, central bank, PDBs, regulatory policy, all should be you know, coming together. Strengthening public-private partnership for the innovative and delivery, because we have public sector, they are strong in some of the areas, private sector, they are also strong. So we have to find out their knowledge, strength, and also uh, you know, try, to, uh, try to match. Then post-COVID green growth push, which is very important. And again, it, was, it, is, it has been observed and it has been agreed that now agri-food uh, uh, sector needs suitable ma manage the environmental and social governance issues and ensure COVID-19 dedicated uh, resources to be used to generate evidence for the future pandemics and disasters, which are very important that how, how agri, uh, uh, how this uh, disaster management uh, funds can be utilized. And finally, we have our next steps. There are five next steps. First one is inclusive representative taxonomy. Already discussed, expanding fiscal incentives, Innovations in financing mechanism, bridging the disconnect of demand and supply, which is very important, and strengthening the global pooled green financing mechanism. I think I'm not going to uh, go in detail because I think I have taken a little bit of more uh, than two minutes. Thank you very much and looking forward for your feedback. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Prasun. I think we can invite Panos now to, to step in in order to um, moderate the session moving forward. Thank you, Azeta. Um, thank you, Panos, yeah. Um, th thank you, um, Prasun. That was a very um, good presentation. I think um, you gave the, the big picture. Um, and where I want to, to stop a little bit just to, to start the conversation, I, your first point was about the taxonomy. I think that we need to be very careful of what we are talking about. We don't want to be greenwashing things. So it's very important to know um, what are the definitions of green finance, climate smart uh, uh, ESG, um, and also have accompanying matrices where we show what is um, what are we measuring here and 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 uh, and back basically the claims of green that we need to have a very transparent and auditable uh, data to do that. Um, it was very interesting also what uh, you mentioned about the policy driven. And here, you know, I wonder how much the policy driven are also what forces the regulators, uh, there are certain um, uh, problems. For example, in China, green finance has to do around uh, reduction of pollution. In Brazil, it could be uh, due to deforestation and loss of biodiversity. So what are the real problems that they drive the policy maker to, to change the, the policies? But I think overall, a big issue here is that how can we um, internalize in the pricing of, of uh, um, uh, products or, or instruments the em environmental externalities, um, like, uh, for example, the carbon taxes. And uh, so we can provide also market incentives um, into the um, into the system. Um, you uh, provided a very good um, uh, analysis of the supply mapping. I think was the low leverage was quite um, important that, uh, that you note. So there is public and private actually on the flows you show that they are, they are not, we're not doing that bad, but the leverage is small and that needs to increase. I think that's a very important point. Um, we've seen some funds also uh, in specific countries with uh, very active uh, policies to promote this PPP, uh, private, public, and uh, still they, they fall into this one to maximum two. So we need to improve the leverage. Where I would like to have heard a bit more is on the demand side. That's where we find, uh, and it's not just an issue of low level of awareness. Um, I think it's, it's a more complicated issue. So I think we need to, to dig uh, deeper on how can we stimulate uh, the demand uh, side. Um, also on the innovation, um, there is a number of innovations, uh, but I think we need to, to get a bit more granular in order to evaluate um, these experiences and, uh, and, and see how much they, they contribute. For example, I find sometimes there is a lot of hype about blockchains and, and other instruments, but how do these things compare to, let, let's say, better incentives or, or uh, um, establishing um, certain other uh, measures? So I think we, on the innovation side, we need to, to show which is the biggest bank for back, um, and, and particularly um, how the public sector, what are the instruments where the public sector can stimulate uh, uh, private sector financing to increase these leverages. So I'll stop here because I know that we're on a tight time and invite participants to, um, to, to speak. Uh, can I say something? Can I provide some feedback? Yes, of course. Okay, Please. thank you, Panos. Uh, well, thank you very much, Prasun, first of all, for excellent presentation, very comprehensive, very, very helpful. 
Uh, just a couple of uh, comments. The first one was, uh, I, I work in FAO, I work in forestry. So I guess my question was uh, the degree to which uh, forestry was uh, considered as part of the agriculture, let's say, uh, uh, frame. And uh, uh, if, if the answer is yes, then I think in your initial uh, uh, scoping of different taxonomies, you mentioned, of course, the climate finance, the sustainable finance, the green finance. I, I would say there is uh, also uh, some literature emerging on, on uh, nature and financing for nature or, or financing for nature-based solutions biodiversity finance, forest finance. It is really quite complicated, in fact. And so I was uh, kind of curious, uh, uh, one of the questions I had is based on your reviews of different uh, taxonomies, you think there will be one that is most useful, let's say from the perspective of FAO, trying to promote investments that uh, uh, do uh, want to promote sustainability in the use of resources, but also have uh, associated development objectives. The, the other uh, sort of uh, uh, suggestions I will have when you mentioned the domestic uh, public finance. Um, I have seen some recent studies by the World Bank that looked at the uh, pension funds, national pension funds. And in fact, even in countries that are very poor, I mean, I saw a, a collection of, uh, of uh, statistics uh, for African countries these uh, pension funds can range anywhere between 10 and even 30% of national GDP. They're very significant. And of course, uh, they have the advantage as opposed to international investors to be much more, uh, less, let's say, uh, uh, nervous about the national risks because they are basically endogenous in, in the whole policy environment and they embed in their own mandate, you know, the contribution to development and things like that. So I think it would be helpful to add maybe this aspect of, of pensions. Uh, the other, uh, I have two specific questions. One is in the stock taking, whether the data you collected allows for maybe a separate analysis if we want to look more specifically at agroforestry or at forestry. I don't know whether this would be possible or not. And the second question I had is that uh, I was uh, uh, not news, but nice to see an estimate that only a tiny fraction of this climate finance actually reaches the smallholders. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about it, because this is a problem that affects the whole agriculture, including forestry uh, sector, you know, there's a lot of talks about hundreds of billions of dollars floating and funds being set up right and left, but the money that actually reaches the smallholders are really uh, peanuts. So if you could say something about that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, Prasun, please go ahead. I, on the uh, forestry, I would like okay. to, uh, uh, Prasun, on the forestry side, I would like also to add whether you look at fisheries, because there is a big thing now evolving on this, what they call them blue bonds. Um, and we're working in, in Asia on some of these blue bonds. So uh, when you address the forestry, if you can uh, add uh, whether you consider fisheries also. Thank you, Marco. It's a, uh, I mean, I think it's a, it's a huge area which actually we, we, we missed most of the things. But definitely when we talk about actually food system, we are considering forestry, landscaping, landscape, and also the fisheries and other animal husbandry into, into the whole uh, system. But definitely if you, if we need to have, you know, granularize it, like uh, no ugly uh, fisheries and uh, forestry, I think we need more data uh, to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, when we when you go to the data analysis for any of them and any international uh, financing agencies or the MDBs, what we found is always they talk about agri forestry land use all together, and agri they define as agri 
animal husbandry fisheries all together and i i i i, I agree with what um, uh, pano said that uh, blue the blue uh, uh, bond and uh, the green bond i think fao is also working uh, with a uh, blue bond and green green bond uh, so i uh, i don't know how how to get the data on the blue bond <laughs> but definitely i will ask uh, uh, my colleague in uh, in fao fisheries department uh, ramon uh, to support me in uh, getting the data uh, so that we can granularize some of the data on uh, on the uh, fisheries but forestry you know, definitely agroforestry is a you now what we what we also have one very important issue is the ecosystem services so the financing the ecosystem services definitely will cover uh, the forestry uh, uh, and other ecosystem uh, for example landscape and all this all together uh, so that that data we do have uh, uh some uh, no some data at a national level but not at, at a global level that how much has been uh, invested on the uh, ecosystem uh, servicing financing the ecosystem servicing so i think i think if i i can i can fall back to you on getting some data from fao uh, no, uh, fao data system uh, so so that we can we can enrich this uh, particular uh, paper Thank you very much, Marco. But uh, Prasun, just to, for clarification, the data that you have does not include uh, the, the green financing for forestry or for uh, fisheries. It does the data does not include that. This is additional. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, so I, I know that. Yeah. Um, this is a thank question. It, it's a, it's a question. It's uh, it's not a statement. It, I'm trying no, to find basically out. When, yeah. when when we go to the World Bank, uh, you know, the detail of their no public uh, domain uh, available data, the data is agriculture, land use, forest, and ecological uh, resources. So this is the data. So they have not done any granularization on that, but definitely fisheries are not there. I think fisheries are, is not there. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <clears throat> I see a question from Bettina. Um, her question is that if we consider the five areas of action in the next step uh, slide against the four escalators in an earlier slide, does the paper look at the role of each of these escalators in taking forward each of these next steps? This is the prioritization, like where, where do we start? Yes, uh, uh, yes. I think uh, I think it's a, it's a very, you know, uh, uh, maybe there is some. Uh, if we can, we can add also one more escalator on on the green finance uh, you know, ec ecosystem. But what we found that yes, the escalators uh, are uh, something which we need to follow, uh, or we we have already on the ground. It is already there. Uh, international cooperation is there, but we need to escalate that. So that's why I could put it as an escalator. Uh, but next steps are basically what we need to, you know, uh, to um, to push through our our engagements in in various forums and uh, you know uh, uh, other areas like a knowledge uh, partnership and uh, you know, uh, increase the knowledge breadth on that area. Thanks Thank you. Me. There is also a big request to share the presentation with um, the the audience. Um, there is a, a, one of the comments uh, for Prasun. Um, there is that um, there is a recommendation concerning the Greek taxonomy that the EU Commission has developed a list of activities that can be considered as green, ranging from forestry to energy and agricultural activities. So. Um, have you I, looked yeah i have seen yeah i have seen that but what actually you know it just stuck to mind my mind that uh, see green finance uh, in the uh, european union and also the developed countries like uh, us and european union uh, the green finance is uh, uh, to agriculture is not a, a not a not a bigger issue so the uh, 
when we are we uh, when we, if we consider all those recommendations of you uh, that uh, will be will it be effective or will it be applicable to asia africa or not in america so these are these are the big questions because that 85% of the total uh, no, uh, smallholders are in asia and uh, africa uh, specifically asia is uh, around 65% so when we talk about the green finance to agri and the food system, I think we, we need to know, go for a little bit of a global and definition. We, we, we have considered in, in the paper, if you see, you will see that there is a EU recommendations are already there. Uh, we have considered EU recommendation, uh, but for, for a, at a, at a, as a broader sense, so, so when we talk about the nested uh, no, uh, uh, definition, we have considered EU, but I am still not sure that whether that will be still applicable. And that is what our, you know, uh, the audience and the members today, they will be telling us that whether this is applicable in, in Africa or also in, in Asia or Latin America, where the, uh, the smallholder farmers are, uh, you know, are the major player in the whole uh, agri-food system. Just to follow up on this, on the smallholder, I think this is a, a quite concerning, although the number, the 1.7%, probably is not very dissimilar about the amount that goes to the farmers in agriculture overall that goes to smallholders. I, but the, the issue is probably as much as the demand, as much as the supply uh, problem. Um, we see uh, from our activities that um, the majority of the green finance is driven by SMEs, by, by agro-businesses that is much easier because they know the issues. This is the issue about awareness that you mentioned, uh, Prasun, is much easier for larger entities to, to understand the technologies and the impact. Uh, as we go down to the smallholder par farmers, that becomes much more difficult and about knowing the technologies and being incentivized to adopt certain technologies, not just knowing and also, if they know the technologies, they are uncertain how these benefits, the theoretical benefits, would translate to their specific uh, activities. So there is a lot of uncertainty, lack of knowledge, awareness, and incentives all put together um, into this. Um, one interesting example is what we have seen in China, where you have these large agro-businesses, companies, some of them, they call them dragon heads who basically they lead value chains and basically they drive investments all through their value chains to green their value chain so they become the driver of uh, of that even to to smallholder farmers that system seems to be working we don't have an exact evaluation but seems to to be working that you work with these large companies that they have every incentive to push standards green standards to their whole value chain No, that's 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 the very important point that when we when we have gone to the you know, drivers of uh, uh, you know green finance, we found that it is it is not not the food security, it is not even the water access to water, it is basically the uh, 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 the policies, the policies, the awareness uh, about the climate change, the knowledge, all these are uh, these are more uh, important drivers than uh, than the food security. So the question here is that how we can change that, that uh, policy will be there definitely, but how we can change also that this is important, that the water is important, forest is important, fisheries are important, uh, no, and they should be the driver, the technologies can be the driver. So that, that, that you know, changing or you know, reversing, this is also a very, very important issue for all of us. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Prasun. I don't see many more any more comments on the uh, box, and I think we have reached to our there time is limit. One, oh, one, okay. one hand hand raised, I think. Okay. One hand is there. I don't know. There is one hand we can see. I mean, maybe it is uh, by. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a good, great presentation, and uh, I'm from FAO. I'm an aquaculture officer, a fish farming. Oh. 
you know, <laughs> uh, fish farming is a new industry, so we uh, have been subject to a uh, very stringent environmental uh, scrutiny, I would say. But uh, recently, because there are certain species like seaweeds, uh, um, bivalves, they are considered restorative species because they can kind of uh, uh, extract nutrients from the uh, from the environment. And then the so the you can see the NGOs like uh, uh, Nature Conservancy, they pay attention to uh, this agriculture. So it's a new a uh, good sign for uh, this subsector of uh, agricultural fisheries. So I, my question to you is like, for uh, green climate finance, is there a principle about that the mechanism to use this kind of finance to reward ecosystem services or environmental benefits? Because I can see when I joined this uh, NGO people, they, they may not realize that uh, if we need to punish those polluters, we should also reward those people, uh, those industry or those activities that provide ecosystem services. I think somehow establish this kind of principle in this green uh, fi financing mechanisms. Also bring in other kind of uh, uh, economic mechanisms like, like the carbon credits, uh, nitrogen credits and so on into a, a overall framework just to see how we can really benefit this ecosystem services and then motivate the, the development of these activities in in general i think it would be uh, very useful and personally i would like to see those those concrete case studies for example a certain company or, or, or community or, or country how they kind of utilize this concept or, or utilize uh, all these uh, uh, vehicles uh, mechanisms out there and financial vehicles uh, mechanisms out there to uh, facilitate the environment friendly uh, uh, activities I, I really like to see more of this thank you very much Thank you. You you did a you did a, a brief uh, response to that because basically, you know, we are working with FAO of, uh, Fisheries Department with NF uh, uh, IO. I think uh, we I work uh, closely with uh, Ramon uh, in two countries. Currently, we are working on a very brief uh, small project of FAO on developing the uh, national level platforms for the fishery fish, uh, uh, small scale fisher communities. So we call it, uh, uh, which is in, in the Philippines and in Thailand. So there we are actually trying to bring some of these aspects, as you said, into a common platform that they understand and then they negotiate and do the conversation with the government and ask for the incentives for them. So we are working on that. One of the report is almost ready. I think in the, by the next uh, uh, month, uh, 15th, you will get the report which will be a joint report of APRACA FAO uh, on, on the Philippines. Thank you, Prasun. I think we have uh, finished our allocated time. Um, yeah, I pass it to Azeta for, for the next uh, session. I think there is a break in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Prasun and Panos, for you know the, your interventions here and for sharing the, your insights with us. It was really interesting. Um, I think we now have to take a break according to the agenda. We are about five minutes over time. So my suggestion, unfortunately, would be to cut the break short. So let's have a 10 minute break. And please, please be back by 2.55 in order to start again with the next sessions. Thank you so much again and uh, see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> Azita, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, good. I didn't know whether I had to take uh, to take over or, but you're back, so over to you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry I actually joined the two minutes late because I was having connection problems. I still have things that are really stuck here in my computer. So I think we start. Um, okay, so thank you very much um, to everyone for, um, being back. 
to uh, continue attending the workshop. Um, I hope you had a good break, although it was very brief, relatively brief. Let us now dive um, right into our next session. This is technical session number two in your agendas, and we will focus on the role of the public sector alongside development finance, finance institutions and development partners in improving the enabling environment to unlock green finance for agriculture and food. And focusing particularly on things like the use of funds, policy and regulatory instruments, incentives, and so on. Regarding the structure of the session, as I mentioned um, at the opening, we will start with a keynote presentation followed by panel discussion with four selected experts and the moderator. I would, at this point, pass the floor to Bettina Prato, the senior coordinator of SAFIN, who will be moderating this session. Uh, Bettina will take us through what promises to be a really engaging session on a topic that is really critical, and I think it's of broad interest to our audience. So, Bettina, over to you to introduce the keynote speaker and take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Azeta, and uh, great to see you all there. So many familiar faces and, uh, and also lots of, uh, of new faces uh, showing that there is a lot of interest in this, uh, in this topic. So I'm not going to spend, like I said, I'm not going to spend much time introducing the speakers uh, so that we uh, are as efficient as possible in using the time we have. We're going to start with a presentation that will frame um, the session from Josef Zahar, who's an affiliated researcher at the Stockholm Environment uh, Institute. Um, and uh, that is going to be followed by a panel with Josef, as well as with Diletta Giuliani, who's the head or the Finance for Nature Practice at Systemic, Hans Lott, who is the Global Head of UN Environment Partnerships at Rabobank, and Claude Thor, who is uh, uh, um, responsible of the Keep Projet, so um, he's a uh, um, uh, project team manager at IFD, Agence Française de Développement. So, um, Yosef, you uh, have the floor to get us started with, uh, with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bettina. And uh, I hope that uh, I'm heard well. Um, I really like, first of all, to thank everybody um, for, for inviting me. Uh, Azeta, uh, Rasun, it was very interesting to hear the previous pre presentation and discussion. I think this is a very, uh, very enlightening, enlightening, enlightening uh, kind of aspects are brought on this industry that uh, that we were actually missing. So I very much look forward to kind of seeing the final, uh, the final draft of, of this paper. Um, let me start by um, I'll simply share the screen and uh, so we can uh, go straight ahead. Uh, okay, so I hope this, uh, one second, please. Okay, so I hope the screen is, uh, can easily, uh, is seen easily. Um, so I'd just like to, 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 uh, to, to bring forward, I mean, that this discussion is going to be um, kind of taking insights from uh, private capital, uh, green investments, and trying to get lessons from it to, um, to basically the capital markets uh, current situation. A slight overview, kind of understanding of capital markets, is, I would say status, and then from there, how does that actually relate to sustainable agriculture. And actually the, the kind of the focus would be how, how, I mean, after having those kind of insights, what policy or what thing, what things can we do uh, to actually to make it happen? Uh, if it's regulatory policy or, or DFI's uh, intervention. Uh, so let me move forward. So I think, I mean, here, I mean, looking at the kind of impact, the, the private assets, which, which actually are not capital markets, are, are the funds which are actually making their way these days outside of local economies, external funds that are making their way into climate and, and basically agriculture and impact activity. 
So uh, this, in a way, this kind of, this fund, this slide shows the overall, um, uh, I would say funds being invested, assets under, under management. And uh, so if, if, as you can see, I mean, uh, what goes mostly is uh, from private funds perspective, it most, mostly is being funded are the, are the microfinance inst institutions uh, versus uh, uh, food and agriculture. So total assets are uh, in around 10 billion for microfinance, but much less than that goes to food and agriculture. So actually a lot of the funds that do actually end up in food and agriculture, uh, is it smallholder or others, in fact, go through microfinance institutions. So the question, why does that go uh, this way from private finance is that, uh, I mean, the, the answer to that is that financial institutions are far easier to quantify in terms of risk for international investors. And therefore a lot of funds would actually make their way uh, through them through financial institutions. Uh, if we look at the uh, maturity of debt for these uh, subsectors, we can actually see that uh, also on the microfinance side, the, the, the tenor, the, the, there's a far longer tenor of, of investments uh, versus food and agriculture. And if you look at climate and energy, I mean, it's also much uh, longer tenors. So in, in a way, I mean, there is a, this is a fun funding issue where in order to make the transition, in order to invest in food and agriculture climate transition, we do need, need longer tenors, which currently are not available directly food and, through food and agriculture funds. Very small, very small amounts of actually making their way to uh, low, low income, income countries. And you can see the yellow uh, lines here, I mean, indicate less than 10%, I mean, less than 5% on all sectors. So most of it goes to developing countries, but not LDCs. And also uh, places, I mean, like seeds, which are difficult to finance, uh, funds are not making their way there. Uh, and that's something which uh, deserves an understanding. And of course, that is where uh, it's indicated by concessional funds. If we talk about the blended finance instruments actually need to come in order to make it happen for those economies. This also tackles the same issue where both microfinance and food and agriculture in a way that, that funds end up in the same income, in to, a lot of it goes to agriculture. Uh, as you see, the, the rating that the, the, the funds which are there rated by Moody are just below investment grade, where, for instance, for climate and energy, uh, the funds are, are lower. So the median for investments in climate and energy is lower than that, indicating that there is a far better, uh, and in fact, it is reflecting the fact that far more concessional finance goes into the climate and energy sector than microfinance and food and agriculture, allowing them actually to reach a much lower debt rating and in fact providing debt instruments to lower, uh, to actually to, to LDCs or other uh, areas which are uh, more difficult to finance. That just bringing an example from uh, Asia, Asia Pacific, uh, where uh, SEA Asia is based in Bangkok. So, in fact, what we look at, I mean, th there are also very uh, big uh, di disadvantages for, for private sector funds, and there is a disparity in, fin in financing. So as you can see, none of, as being said before, none of those funds are actually making their way into the uh, very little to NDCs. And there is a disparity in a way that says, okay, Cambodia, due to certain reasons, is proportionally much higher, for instance, than India. So a lot goes to India but there are restrictions, there are country restrictions that funds actually cannot, miss, it cannot meet. There, is, there are certain other restrictions which limit the funding to India. And if you look at Cambodia, uh, relative to the population, there is a lot of funding going there, which also reflects the fact of that the financial, uh, financial sector is, is quite developed and, uh, and also the microfinance industry. So, these kind of uh, imbalances need to be addressed when we tackle this area with capital markets. Just a brief note about smart money. I mean, it's this, this has been identified by venture capitalists as the, almost the next big thing, smart agriculture in developing economies. 
and it's it's on the wall. So it basically, the, uh, the the estimates are there. We are talking about twenty two billion by twenty twenty five. Uh, the, the, if you can see the graph, I mean, 10 years ago, it was nothing. Today, already a, a large amount of money goes to agri-tech uh, deal activity from really top financiers and venture capital institutions, understanding very clearly where the trend goes. So um, we, we should be very, very optimistic about it and also learn from trends. For instance, vertical farming startups and uh, vertical farming livestock monitoring Precision farming are very much kind of the next hot thing that, that is being talked about. Um, I've indicated some deals that have happened in the millions uh, for all to understand the potential and what's happening. Just a word about COVID. Uh, we are not yet there in terms of, of, of the financial institutions and we, we don't yet understand what happened. And we understand a lot, but the full impact is not yet understood. Have, have people have lost their assets or not? Can they actually meet the moratorium uh, following, following actually resumption of activities or not? There is still a lot of risk in the system. One way out is financing through a, a green, finance, green financing through capital markets, which could actually support post-COVID recovery. So uh, quoting also uh, Vito uh, Gaspar uh, from uh, uh, basically, uh, the quote says that rich, rich countries with access to capital markets can spend as much as needed in order to cover the COVID-19 crisis. And you can see in this, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, illustration where a developed countries have much better prospects actually to reaching the sustainable development, development goal. So uh, Vitor Kasper from IMF, of course. I'd just like to kind of touch uh, some main, uh, uh, basically, takeaways. A, we need capital markets. B, we need capital markets. And the third point is, is also that we need capital markets. So you can review those points. Uh, we do need to go through FIs versus, versus directly to SMEs or MSMEs, simply because it is, when you're talking about the scales of billions, how can we quantify SMEs to institutional investors? FIs, we can, and they can be the intermediaries. There is a vast opportunity for the agri sector and it's on the wall. We need to take to, to really understand that and engage top financiers in this activity. And uh, basically capital markets accessibility is crucial and important. And it's also a necessity for post COVID-19 recovery. If there are many issues with financial institutions, which is yet to be seen. And also concessional funds, are best utilized to reach LDCs, but also to inc increase the, law, the term financing. As, as seen, I mean, if we, do, if we want to reach the transition, we need to increase the, to actually reach to, to provide long-term financing. And this is where concessional funds could actually come in. Just again, touching the capital markets, and I think Pasun has, has also mentioned, I mean, such 1.7% goes to, to, to in fact smallholder, I think it's even too high of an estimate. The whole, the whole market, in fact, uh, uh, in a way, 33 billion as private funds going into emerging markets, kind of climate and sustainability, another perhaps 500 billion would come from DFIs, but the whole market, capital markets uh, potential is 89 trillion. And annually, as we heard before, we need hundreds of billions. This would definitely come from capital markets uh, and there, simply there's no other, uh, no other answer. Uh, just briefly about green bonds market developments, uh, it's gonna be exponential. And the German government just yesterday or the day before has issued the third issuance uh, with 30 years of 30 years tenure, providing benchmarks as well for other issuances because they've they've actually issued a uh, green along non-green. Uh, the market is expected to jump to one trillion in 2021. I'm sorry, 22. There's a mistake there. Uh, we are going to be, uh, uh, in fact, um, reaching such amounts which would allow a lot to reach to agriculture and rural financing. Recent deals which kind of of interest to us is the securitization deal, which goes to MFIs 
and other sustainability uh, bonds with which were issued to MFIs. These are small amounts at the moment, but they actually will, will show the way uh, forward in my view. Briefly, what could be done through capital markets? It's not only green bond or sustainability bond. So we can have existing impact. These are tools that could be developed. Existing impact funds that use the platform for issuing sustainability bonds. DFIs supporting sustainability bonds issuance for FIs, which then on land to SMEs, MSEs, uh, MSMEs, et cetera. And this is already happening, of course. Guarantee schemes, uh, by DFIs for local banks, and then on land, um, national development banks could issue sustainability bonds, and they've done so. Uh, and all, of course, approaching the agriculture sector, international guarantee scheme, uh, allowing uh, local institutions, uh, investors. In that was actually men was mentioned before by one of the speakers. How can we actually make a local the local funds by life insurance by uh, pension funds? The local funds in the countries take part in this in this uh, in this actually activity, and also private sector uh, or, or or DFIs could could lead regional uh, schemes, which are actually missing now. Uh, this is an example for a regional scheme, so I will not go too much into detail. But this is a typical structure. So we have institutional investors, we have uh, concessional funds. They're coming to kind of an uh, offshore lender, an SPV. And then there are instruments coming to, to actually make it to reduce the risk and increase return. So there are FX instrument, local currency, uh, providing local currency. There is a first loss mezzanine, FX hedging, guarantees in the mix, and technical assistance, uh, which actually support. And that could allow for regional programs, that could allow for pooling strategy, that could allow for many, many actually recipients, small recipients, which otherwise could not access themselves to capital markets. These are the blended finance kind of providers, the concessional funds providers. So they are on the right, KFW, FMO, IFC, uh, but mostly DFIs, they need the, the governments. They would not themselves invest in concessional finance. They would need government to support them or to be partnering with trust or in governments. Uh, this so far 140 billions have been mobilized, 40% of that through funds. Uh, so far, um, with technical assistance um, and concessional, fin non concessional finance is the most common form of, of concessional finance. So either going into the structure or technical assistance. Of course, a lot of, it, a lot of it has to be mobilized, but more than that, it has to be mo mobilized to capital markets rather than uh, private sector funds. Way forward, I, just generally for capital markets, if issuing emerging markets uh, sustainability bonds, we need sustainable finance policies and frameworks in place. There is now a great bond issuance momentum. And these are, by the way, uh, points which are identified by a recent IFC, uh, uh, basically document. Uh, capital market developments and accessibility to capital markets. So if we, haven't, if we don't have a locally developed capital markets, we can actually approach a, a, a hub, a financial hub. There is no, nothing wrong with that. Also a sovereign can issue, can issue a bond in a, in a, in a hub and not in domestic capital markets in this, if these are not developed enough. Uh, governance and political stability are also key. And there should be a strong commitment to sustainable development, development objectives. And that by itself will meet a lot of uh, investors demand. And we have seen that with green bond issuance by emerging markets in Asia Pacific. And, and that met uh, uh, quite a lot of demand and, and, and very much boosted the, uh, the issue. I would like to actually focus on this uh, next uh, slide. Um, and this is a very important kind of taking all the key aspects that we spoke about, uh, the, the, the insights, uh, the, the, the action that needs to be taken uh, in the countries by, by the regulators, by, by governments could be split into, let's say, central banks, uh, finance, agriculture, and environment ministries. Uh, we have to look at DFIs. Uh, what can they do? And we also look at the, you have to, we have to look at the international donors community. How can they actually, what is their role here? So in terms of central banks, 
Uh, it is very important that uh, in many of the uh, economies, the, the, the approval of products, the approval of sustainable agricultural product, products, financial products by local banks, by, by financial institutions, MFIs will be actually a smoother and you know it should not take two, three years to approve a, a financial product and lessons could be learned from other places rather than inventing the wheel. Um, there are some uh, regulatory barriers for external drink, uh, debt financing. Some places simply they would not accept debt finance from outside, either from capital markets or from uh, a, a impact fund. So in going back to the slide showing the areas, some countries that are not receiving those funds, this, um, this very much relates to this, to this aspect, the, the government, the, the regulatory hurdle to actually get those funds is very high. Um, furthermore, there needs to be by the central bank the advancing of TCFD. Uh, we need to think in the financial system, portfolio risks, opportunities, and the pricing should go accordingly to incentivize funds, funds flow to the green, and, and basically provide resilient approaches. So by itself, it will actually move the, the, the financial sector towards the green and the agriculture, green agriculture. Furthermore, there needs to be a regulatory support for local institutions uh, fund mobilization. That was spoken about before. So in a way they have the fiduciary requirements that they act like any other funds in the world and they need to be diversified. They need to make sure that they're not gonna lose their, their capital, but with assurances they can be provided that and participate in the local funding of agriculture. There needs to be regulatory support for the development of local retail banking products. So there is a lot of retail funds being invested locally in local, local, local funds. This could be diverted to agriculture. And there is the momentum now, the retail, the retail understand that. And many people want to invest in agriculture and, and impact activities. And there needs to be, by the central bank, there needs to be continuous support for digital transformation, which is a very much key for accessibility of, uh, of climate finance and the transparency and impact reporting, uh, pretty much it's all related. As for uh, ministries, finance ministries, they need to develop framework for issues of green sustainability bond, again, in, in line with COVID-19 recovery path. Um, there needs to be engagement for formation of, formation of local regional blended long-term financing instruments. So there, there are examples like the catalytic uh, facility in, in ASEAN, it's not in, related to agriculture, but if we actually, we need to actually, they need to engage with DFIs, with, with financial private sector to start the dialogue. It will take two, three years to develop those structures that would then uh, benefit all. And there needs to be an introduction of financial incentive schemes for, for a transition. I mean, the same as it was done for energy efficiency uh, programs. There's no, I mean, one on one has to, to be two. And, you know, if we are financing, let's say, drip irrigation for a small all the farmers in a certain location, unfortunately, they won't be able to pay it un unless they have also incentives. So the financial institutions will get funds from outside, but they need to, this needs to be met by local funds to support them for the transition. Uh, furthermore, tax incentives. I'm sorry, I will have to ask you to really wrap up because we're going quite a bit over time. Sure. Are you coming to an end? Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I will wrap up. Yeah. So uh, basically, also tax incentives such as waiver for international green debt funding is very important. And I think that by this, I could wrap up. There's also very important role for DFIs and international donors communities. Uh, and that could be elaborated for the, further. But I think the key message is that we need to identify what's currently not working. and and based on and mostly in the private, private, in, private uh, funding market and, and then translate that to the debt capital market and make it work in debt capital markets. So thank you, thank you very much. And I hope that I'm not- uh, Thank you, Yosef. Yeah. Sorry for, uh, for cutting you a little bit short. Uh, um, you know, I think, sure. you know, this, this was so rich and, and comprehensive. You know, there was a question from someone in the chat that asked whether you can share um, the link to the private asset impact fund report, but then I see that Liz from uh, from Small Foundation already provided the link, so that question is taken care of. Um, let me just uh, move to to the panelists. I was going to ask each one of the panelists, you know, what is in your view, in your experience, uh, maybe sort of the top two three elements of an enabling environment to really um, address 
the, the obstacles to the mobilization to the, the larger engagement of capital markets in, in this endeavor. Um, but now that I see uh, there were so many elements already on the table in your presentation, uh, Yosef, actually, maybe I will also ask, you know, I will kind of tweak this question a bit and uh, start with Diletta, you know, asking what are your reactions to, uh, to, to this analysis and does it resonate with you? I mean, are there particular elements in the enabling environment as you see them? From your perspective at, at systemic that you know you think are particularly worth underlying in this analysis or that you would like to bring to the table in addition. So Diletta, over to you. Absolutely and thank you Martina, thank you Youssef for such a um, comprehensive presentation and I think I was going to um, exactly share, share some of our views. At Systemic I think together with the Blended Finance Task Force and the Food and Land Use Coalition we actually um, try to answer, I think, this question of what does an enabling environment look like by looking at the inefficiencies in the way current food and land use system are financed. And we did come to some of the conclusions, you know, that Youssef um, has mentioned. And um, there's a couple of papers, particularly better finance, better food, and a number we also explored actually and tried to gather uh, a lot of examples of what works and what needs to be scaled. Um, which was also another interesting exercise sometimes look, looking at the solutions. But if I just kind of summarize the analysis that we did, I think we found there were kind of three areas of inefficiencies, if you want. Um, so the first one was broadly in the, the capital allocation, particularly when we uh, think about smaller scale lag. And I think what we really came to the conclusion that of Youssef's presentation as well, that we really need to use local intermediaries more. So FIs and MFIs that can really aggregate some of the, and that have them uh, also local expertise and that can really aggregate uh, some, of these, um, some of these projects. And the other point important there is also to really harness the power of technology and innovation. And we've seen how digitization of uh, receipts, for example, can really address some of, some of the well-established barriers to financing, such as land tenure issues, credit profile of borrowers and limited access to collateral. That's another important element there where we're trying to really move capital where, you know, it hasn't, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's simply not going. The other real area that we noticed was um, an inefficiency in, in risk assessment. So this prevents investors from making informed choices, uh, which means that, you know, they might be investing in, in land use, uh, that don't even mitigate and often maybe even exacerbate climate change. And this doesn't come across from, from the, the, the pricing or from how these investments are, are assessed from a, from a risk perspective. And of course, what we need here, uh, which also, Yusuf, you mentioned, is really better disclosure uh, of climate and interrelated financial risk. And finally, uh, another big area was on the um, inefficiencies around public finance allocation. I think you know, others um, will have touched on the issue of subsidies. Uh, and, and, and we obviously commissioned some, some research that showed that just 15% you know, of the 700 billion subsidies to farmers support public good outcomes. I mean, we know this is, uh, this is a, 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 big, uh, a big topic. But what we dug a bit more into was actually the need to um, modernize in some way development finance. And I think this was also you know, partly what you, what you have touched upon, which is how are donor governments and development capital providers, um, not only they probably need to increase their support to ag when we're looking at their climate finance targets, uh, but also they need to think about how to be more, more catalytic uh, by optimizing the use of instruments such as guarantees and also supporting blended finance structure. I think Yosef, you showed something very comprehensive where you know all different kind of types of development capital providers can come in to um, hedge different risks. And they should really focus on you know, how to mobilize more private capital to the sector. Thank you. Thank you, Diletta. I think that this, uh, this you know, leads me um, sort of quite, quite effectively into the question that I wanted to raise with, with Hans. Also having the presentation from Yosef in, in the background, but looking particularly uh, in the context of the enabling environment at how concessional finance is used, including through blended structures, um, to you know, lengthen the investment horizon of you know, capital markets, but also you know, directing investment flows towards achieving greener impact 
Um, I know you have quite a lot of experience in uh, in this space, including through Agri3. So what is what is your sense? I mean, you know, are is 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 he also pointing to the right enablers? Can you add maybe a little bit more um, granularity to what is needed, what is possible in this space? Hans, over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bettina. Um, yeah humbled by all the knowledge uh, that was shared today and i will um i had to rewrite some of my speaking notes as the presentations progressed because they are so rich and really thank you to uh, uh adriano Prasun, uh, Youssef. lots of rich uh, perspectives um i work for a commercial bank and uh, maybe also going back to the comment that uh, a random, a random data made in the beginning is that if we, if the backdrop of all this is to make green mainstream, we need to really consider the public and private leverage and what private needs from public and the other way around. And I think lots has been said, um, but if I would need to mention a top three, Bettina, I would focus first of all on the awareness of the importance of food and agriculture to reach uh, Paris Agreement goals. Um, within the financial industry, that's not uh, common knowledge. It starts with that basic awareness. Um, secondly, once that is um, more um, mainstream in the, in the knowledge base, I think we need to understand that commercial banks are managed by regulators and central banks. And when we talk um, agriculture and food system transition, we talk longer tenor, we talk a longer time. And that's also what you have spoke about. And uh, what I think we need to really understand, and that's a basic, a very basic thing, is that commercial banks do not really have the mandate to go beyond a certain tenor. Um, they are heavily regulated and for a good reason, which is to protect all of our savings. But um, we need to come up with a solution that enables uh, commercial retail banks to go beyond that certain risk appetite to really cater for food system transition. And that can be as simple as a bucket for longer tanners that goes into the food and agricultural industry. And that goes to the upstream part of supply chains more in particular. Um, so that's where the public um, environment could really help governments to talk to the regulators, central banks, and discuss this. Another one is, is quite basic. Um, banks, um, separate from the regulatory framework, they do not per se like food and agriculture because it's a very risky industry. Uh, sorry to say it, but it's just a fact. Uh, it may sound strange coming from Rabobank, but I think that's where we also come in with a few other banks because we've we've done this for quite some time. So um, we need to help banks to de-risk uh, investments in this space. And de-risking can be done in various ways and they have been mentioned, but I would like to highlight just a few. One is through guarantees. Uh, the other one is through technical assistance. Technical assistance is really key. And we, with Agri3, come to more and more the understanding that that bucket may need to increase. And not only for a traditional farmer training on the ground, but also to train banks. What does food and agriculture investment mean? Uh, how do you bank in food and agriculture? We always assume that banks tend to know that. That's not the case. Um, so technical assistance and applying it maybe more widely would really help. And building that bucket into concessional funding would, I think, allow retail banks to step in and say, listen, I'm interested. Um, and if you can help me de-risk and if you can help me build my knowledge base, that would actually help me. And then I can really step in this uh, quote unquote risky space. Um, maybe lastly, because I'm aware of the time, with Rabobank and Agri3, we've, we've had many public-private conversations. 
also going back to Arindam a little bit, who did a shout out to the cultural uh, connection between the two, um, is indeed the understanding. We tend to talk about each other. The public sector needs to do this, policies, procedures, the private sector needs to do that, unleash capital. What we've learned, and it's a terrible cliche, but it's true, we, we need to talk with each other. And what we now notice in the multi-stakeholder uh, fund that we've set up, together with the Dutch government, the UN, uh, FMO, which is the Dutch DFI, and the IDH, the Fair Trade Organization, is that talking with each other about deals really makes it real. Um, and there are all the challenges that we mentioned today in all the presentations that, that were so rich. Uh, come to life in a deal where you do need a multi-stakeholder approach and you do need a partnership because it's not only about finance, it's about technical assistance, it's about digitalization. And unfortunately, these topics tend to sit with different players. So you really need to uh, huddle together and make it work together. Back to you, Bettina. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I think that this uh, this point about, you know, the deals, you know, sort of practice being where it comes alive is uh, is really important. And of course, it's one of the things that makes uh, uh, trying to go to scale so frustrating uh, because it's, it's really difficult to take practice, you know, deal focused, you know, uh, investment focused, vehicle focused uh, uh, partnership, like the depth of the kind of conversation across cultures that you can have in, in context uh, to take it to, to scale, to the scale of ambitions. Uh, Claude, um, coming to you, we heard from Yosef about the importance of financial intermediaries, local financial intermediaries. Villetta picked up on this. Uh, Hans reminded us that among the financial intermediaries uh, at, at country level, commercial banks are not necessarily best placed to, to lead this, this agenda. But we did hear also about the role of public development banks. And I know, you know, you have a lot of experience and knowledge in, in this particular area. And I wonder, um, also IFD has a particularly, uh, sort of a particular leadership role in this space uh, in the Financing Common Summit process. I was wondering, if you, would you like to comment on that particular aspect of the enabling environment? What is really the role of, of uh, public, different types maybe of public development banks in driving this, this agenda forward? How do you see that? Thank you very much, uh, Bettina, and thank you, thank you very much also for the, all the presentation and, and statement uh, by the speakers before. Um, maybe um, I would like to, to remind that ecological transition in the uh, agricultural sector, uh, in land sector, must be financed. And uh, we have to see what are the underlying assets uh, uh, through uh, green finance. Uh, for instance, we have to finance new equipment such as uh, seal drills for direct sowing, land investment for water harvesting, um, plantation for agroforestry, fencing for rotative grazing, etc., etc. So, but and as had been said before, and Hans uh, insisted on, uh, public development banks have a major role to play because of. Um, the market failure of commercial banks to finance uh, agriculture in uh, mainly in uh, developing countries uh, today 60 agriculture uh, public development banks represent 50 per, 15 percent of all public uh, development banks in in the world and all together they can form almost two-thirds uh, of the formal financing for agriculture uh, so we also know that financial inclusion has been solved uh, partly and, and, and greatly above all in countries with tools specifically, specifically oriented to support rural finance through dedicated banks or similar instruments. Uh, this is why uh, PDBs are very important and could contribute to address both financial inclusion and green finance development. And about that, we have, uh, I totally agree with Arin Dom, uh, but uh, saying at the beginning uh, about that uh, uh, financial inclusion is 
the priority uh, in developing country and environment is, uh, and green finance is a niche. So uh, it's very important to, 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 to have this kind of this uh, thing in mind. So PDBs can intervene, intervene directly or indirectly leveraging private financing, but it's very important in rural areas and mobilizing uh, many specific tools uh, that has been presented before. Uh, could be also interest rate subsidy, partial guarantee fund, etc., TA facility. Um, and also there are excellent channels for uh, channeling uh, incentives. Uh, and what we call blended finance, we think uh, mainly about uh, uh, fund, impact fund coming from uh, the North, but you can imagine also blended finance mobilized by uh, national public tools uh, as we see also in, in uh, OECD countries. So uh, they can channel incentives and um, the main instrument for that could be technical assistance, interest rate subsidy and de-risking instruments like uh, partial guarantee fund. Uh, they can help to finance the expected double green revolution uh, because it's uh, the, the underlying assets we are talking about. And uh, with the management of this kind of incentives uh, and also with the issue of accountability and measuring impact because when you use uh, public fund, you have to, to, to have this kind of accountability. And finally, of course, uh, this accountability uh, is very important. Uh, how to identify and characterize uh, these sustainable, uh, sustainable practices uh, in a reliable and robust way, because uh, it's not so easy as it had been said in, in the chat. Uh, and PDBs can test and pilot monitoring, reporting and verification MLV tools uh, to ensure this uh, traceability uh, and making this public uh, ed or incentive for green and social agricultural investment credible. Uh, also, we can uh, be it can the MLV system can be used for managing the exposure of portfolio to risk climate, uh, to risk like climate of biodiversity, etc. And uh, also. Uh, can be used uh, to measure the extra financial environment ESG performance of the investment. So they are, they are very important for that. And uh, to, to, uh, to conclude, uh, I think that the key challenges for the PDB uh, is, uh, and even for commercial banks and financial sector, is to define really what are the underlying assets of, uh, of this green financing. Uh, because we can have agricultural practices that are good for climate, but for, but for biodiversity or water management. Uh, you can see, uh, for instance, direct seeding systems with pesticides in, in Southern America. Uh, and also you can have practices that are good for biodiversity and bad for climate. Example, uh, organic farming with tillage. Uh, so uh, the this, this subject is not uh, at all easy and we need, uh, as Admit said, taxonomy and very robust metrics. Uh, I think another point very important, uh, as Anne said, is also to educate and to raise awareness on, on these issues uh, among the different stakeholders, including bank staff, uh, government representative, and also uh, value chain operators and producers. producers. Uh, uh, another point is that it, in the medium and uh, to long term, the incentives may not be sufficient because uh, especially if they rely only on uh, national budget resources. So regulatory approaches must be used too. Uh, and as Prasun and Youssef said before, uh, we, we, it's very important. Uh, the role of a regulator is very important. How to reward green investments or limit or reduce brown investments in, in, in the bank portfolio because uh, financial institutions like all companies need a price signal to move towards these uh, transitions. Um, and of course, uh, although banks are essential, they will not be enough because it will also be necessary to support the actors on, on the field and uh, therefore, uh, uh, and, and smallholder in particular. 
So uh, we, they need uh, other kind of support like ad, uh, advice or extension services, vocational training, research and development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, huge agenda of uh, of capacity building. Thank you, um, Claude. I saw two uh, questions in uh, in the chat. One was a question to Yosef about which parts of the agri food chain are um, agri investments primarily from from the I suppose from the impact funds um, you were you were discussing mostly flowing um, as um, Kathy uh, who wrote this uh, this question says that her sense is that uh, most investments are flowing downstream in value chains and not so much in, in primary production, which I think uh, I, I would agree with. You know, it's, I think Claude was making the same point um, actually related to, um, to one of, the, one of the, the reasons why public development banks in the context are so important. So I'll let you address that, uh, Joseph, but I also want to uh, put on the table for anyone who wants to take it on. Um, another question, which I actually do think points to a very important issue from an enabling environment perspective, and that is challenges around forex risk uh, for for an exchange rate uh, risks, and uh, whether you know sort of the CITAITA is raising this question, particularly in relation to the challenges faced by DFIs in the Pacific, Fiji and the Pacific. Uh, but I think that that is actually a, a more general challenge for uh, development finance institutions in, in developing countries, but also for, for the community in general. Do we have, um, generally speaking, globally at the regional level, at the country level, robust uh, forex um, uh, risk management uh, instruments? So whoever wants to take that question, I'll come to you, but you also first on um, very quick answer to the question from Kathy. Yes, thank you. So I think this needs to be looked in more uh, detail, uh, but my, my sense is that it's uh, agricultural value, value chain financing, uh, which includes production, trade, distribution, and basically other models. So uh, it, it could be that these are short-term uh, funds mostly, so it could very well be that, uh, Cathy, your sense is right, but uh, we have to look in more de granular detail uh, into those funds. Uh, yeah, so I think one key is that the, the funds which are reaching those, those sectors are private funds. None of that is, is almost none of that is, is capital markets. Okay, thank you. Um, Forex, risk, uh, anyone wants to take that question? Hans? Yeah, I, um, we, within, within, the fund and the bank we have a limited experience but it is a challenge um, very simply put uh, some of the concessional funds and quite a bit i reckon are in dollars and and and, and, and euros um, but they need to be applied elsewhere it, it's very basic and what we uh, all i think struggle with be it impact funds or commercial banks or dfis is that um, we talk about incentives and incentives cost money and the incentives need to be primarily with the farmer, I would say in this particular case, because you cannot expect a farmer to change behavior if there's no incentive. Um, but if you look at a blended finance structure or a blended finance deal and you lose, um, uh, you leak uh, through your swap and your hedge already uh, going from dollars to the local currency where it needs to happen, that's a waste. That's a terrible waste. And if we could um, come up with structures that prevent that, or we could get additional concessional earmarked funding for that, at least a recognition that that is a challenge in any structure, because otherwise it will not work to attract dollar investors and to create incentives on the ground in local currencies. And you know, you, you cannot just have that leakage because the pricing and the uh, uh, spread is thin already. Um, so it's a good point to highlight this today. Thank you. Back to you, Bettina. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dilata, did you want to come in? I saw you nodding. Uh, if not, I'll go to Marco because I see Marco has a question. Did you want to call, to compliment what Hans said? Just very quickly on what Anna, I was really echoing what Hans said. And we have found there are some attempts um, 
on, um, for example, for donors backing, you know, initiatives like TCX currency, which are looking at actually hedging, you know, currencies that are maybe not normally hedged. I mean, these obviously also come at a cost, uh, but there is, I think, uh, one way to create efficiency is actually, you know, the donors to to cover that because I think one one issue is, of course, the burden is always on who who is re receiving the funding. So it has been interesting to see how some of these blended finance solutions are are delivered by um, these kind of mechanisms that are that are supported by northern donors. Thank you. Thank you, Dilita. Marco, you have a question. Please take the floor. Yes. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so I have a question for for Yosef and uh, about the role of financial intermediaries and MFIs in, uh, in supporting small producers. And uh, I mean, my question is this, I understand that the microfinance institutions and these local intermediaries really work uh, for the most part like pass-through finance. You know, they, they basically need uh, standardized uh, solutions uh, they don't really have the capacity to, to have ad hoc, uh, you know, solutions for farmers. So they usually want to see value chains that are already quite developed, uh, uh, business with track records, uh, value chains that are already, you know, with low risks. But when we work with uh, rural farmers, especially in poor areas, you know, this uh, issue of uh, standardization is, is very difficult. I mean, they usually have a very diversified uh, uh, livelihood schemes. Uh, they, they, they produce a number of products. Uh, the value chains might not be very well known. And so there is, uh, it's a great idea to work through financial intermediaries, but I still feel there is a gap to make this work in reality, uh, and I say, of course, I have a, my perspectives come more from the forestry and, and agroforestry thing, but I would be curious to know from you or anybody in this call, if you have good cases of how this, uh, this joint uh, has been addressed. Thank you. So Yosef, let me, uh, thank you, Marco. Let me uh, also note that someone, uh, Emmanuel also commented, most of the MFIs charge a lot of interest um, which is not favorable, uh, you know, it's, or it's, it's challenging for, uh, for a lot of farmers. I, I actually had the same curiosity, you know, when, when he said there's a lot of potential maybe to, to work around securitization of MFI's portfolios and, and try to green that as a way to combine the agenda of financial inclusion and, and, and um, green uh, finance for agriculture. So I, I really look forward to your reply over to you, Yosef. Uh, yeah, um, I think that, uh, of course, this is a fair point, but it also has to touch, is touching what, uh, what is being said by, by Hans uh, in terms of the um, capacity building. Uh, so concessionality uh, coming at, on the capacity building is actually crucial uh, in, for this aspect. It needs to be seen at much higher levels than uh, has been seen, let's say, for, for, for clean technologies. So if we're talking about the 5% of the financial structure being technical assistance, I think we have to be looking at more like 15%, 20% of the financial structure going into the technical assistance capacity building for those institutions, for the communities to actually um, move, kind of do the transition. This is a transition, a very uh, important transition. So for a few years, this concessionality needs to be uh, provided. Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether Claude um, or, you know, sort of, or, or um, Hans or Diletta, you also had any thoughts on this particular uh, point related to uh, MFI. Otherwise, I'll ask for soon uh, to ask this question and then I wrap up. No yeah, comments, I, could, Claude, I, I could make one comment if, if I may, Bettina, very briefly. Yeah, I think um, you and, and Claude as well. I, I saw him opening his mic. So, first yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so I do believe we need to go local for solutions because it needs to happen on the ground and you just cannot do that from London, Paris or Zurich. Uh, so we need to rope in the local banks, the local MFIs. On knowledge, I think TA, I would re-emphasize that again, but then again, work together with the supply chain, work together with the aggregators, work together with the off-takers of the farmers. Uh, they tend to be bigger, they tend to have a balance sheet. They tend to be sometimes bankable. 
which provides an entry point for an MFI or local bank to step into the supply chain reality and support the supply chain, the ecosystem of the farmer. Back to you, Claude or Bettina. Thank yes, you, uh, Hans. Uh, just, just one point, I, I really want to emphasize what you just said, because I think when we look at the enabling environment or the ecosystem around green finance, we, we tend to look at the finance players and the regulators um, and not enough to the various actors in the agri value chain ecosystem that also have a key role in generating the demand side, but also in de-risking supply. Claude. Yes, thank you very much. I, I support uh, totally that uh, and said because uh, fi rural finance and uh, financial inclusion in rural areas is totally linked with proximity. And uh, so we need uh, institution based uh, in, in rural uh, areas and uh, in proximity with uh, the, the rural population. And uh, about the tools, uh, don't forget that historically, uh, financing um, agriculture has been uh, taken in, into account through mainly uh, public instruments, even in OECD countries. And uh, because it, as I've been said before, it's more risky, it's uh, more um, costly, uh, and um, you, you need public tools at the beginning and, and the issue, uh, and when uh, this public in tools uh, let the, the room to, to uh, uh, commercial uh, institution. Thank you, Claude. Prasun, you have the last word, basically. Um, so very short, because otherwise we go over time. Over to you, Prasun. Yeah, yeah, it's not a, it's not a last word. It's what, what, uh, actually, what I could understand from the question of uh, no, uh, questions are also the, the, the and so the rural finance uh, you know, uh, industry in the, uh, uh, is divided into two parts in the globe. The private sector, the uh, uh, rural finance industry are more active on the downstream of the value chain. And that is an acceptable fact. Whereas the public sector are more active on the upstream of the value chain, starting from no incentive uh, for the farmers, uh, for the uh, fertilizers, uh, inputs, uh, the water, all these things. So now there is a, we are now at the inflection, the point of inflection, how these two will be coming together. And basically what we found, and also I fully agree what Hans and the others are talking about, that there must be some, uh, they must talk each other. And we, with my 30 years of experience, what I found, they generally don't talk. Private sector, uh, financial industry, they need a infrastructure, good infrastructure to carry on their intervention on the, well, for the uh, downstream actors. Whereas the private uh, government sector or the public sector, because they have a political, no interest, they are on that. Now this, this platform, how, how this kind of a platform like central banks and all can come together and this, uh, solve these issues. I think this is a, this is a real you know, problem and this is one of the very important you know, outcome of this particular uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Tina. you, uh, Prasun. So um, I'm delighted that we actually have uh, private and public uh, sector uh, brought together in this particular panel. So in a way, uh, we, we, we try to go for a, for a, a microcosm of uh, and in this, in, this, uh, in this whole workshop. So uh, a microcosm of the solution. Um, again, high expectations around the paper, uh, Prasoon and, and Atheta. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this will also help us get deeper into, into these questions. Let me just say thank you to Yosef, uh, to Diletta, to Hans and uh, to Claude for uh, what I thought was quite um, a rich, but also quite focused uh, discussion. Uh, you know, such a complex set of issues sometimes uh, ends up being all over the place. So we will be sharing the presentation from Yosef uh, for those that have asked me. And for now, I just hand over to Azeta to uh, take us through the, the closing. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Bettina. Thank you, um, Yosef, and the uh, distinguished panelists. 
I think this was really indeed a very, very interesting um, session. The discussions were extremely rich, as Bettina said, but thank you also for being uh, really on time with this, which is also important. So let me go get us to the closing session now. Um, my job is to briefly recap um, the discussion, the key things that came out of the discussions that we had today. Um, what I heard, I, I'm not going to be long, I'm just going to mention what really I retained or what struck me. What I heard is different speakers really in reinforcing each other um, on issues like the importance of the agricultural sector for the greening agenda, the fact that the sector is not receiving enough attention, um, the fact that the awareness on the role of the sector for achieving the uh, Paris Agreement objectives is not there amongst the, um, in the financial industry, as Hans mentioned, and this is a very broadly recognized uh, issue. The fact that agriculture as an industry, as a sector is, is risky. Um, we saw in, um, in Yosef's presentation that uh, um, most of um, what he had in his graph there, um, agricultural projects or activities were non-investment grade level, uh, according to the Moody's classification. And this is of course a problem. Um, speaking to this, also Hans said that commercial banks do not like the sector for this very same reason, because it's considered to be, to be risky and to be low return and all that. And he mentioned that the commercial sector, the banks need to be helped out here um, through de-risking. The public sector can do a lot. Uh, he mentioned that technical assistance is really critical. Guarantee schemes concerning of um, what be, between the needs and what the actual supply in terms of green funding is is even more problematic in agriculture for the least developed countries and for the smallholders. And I would also add for some other marginalized segments there, like youths and women and so on. So really, the issue of inclusivity that some of the speakers, including Adriano at the beginning and uh, Arendam mentioned is extremely important because on green finance um, becoming such an important issue for everybody and everyone wanting to contribute there, we risk that if we don't take into account the inclusivity issues, we are creating new um, disparities, new inequalities uh, that per se can be problematic if, because if the smallholders are really the biggest segment of farming in developing nations, if you exclude this huge segment, I mean, what is the impact that we are going to be making? Um, and therefore, it, it shouldn't be ignored. Another issue that came up more uh, several times in the discussions is the importance of the taxonomies so that and the definitions so that we know what we are talking about and we can measure the effects and we can then identify what is working better than, 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 than others, so to speak. Um, and Panos mentioned that this is an issue also to avoid a lot of greenwashing that, that is out there and we know that, that it exists and, and it's a problem. Um, the importance of internalizing environmental uh, externalities and costs through the pricing to produce the correct price signals and incentives that the different players uh, need to have in order to, um, to align better with, uh, with the, the trajectory that we want to take. The importance of the enabling environment policies and regulations, it came out as really the main uh, or the most critical uh, driver for uh, green finance, as we saw that in, in, in what uh, Prasun was presenting there. We also heard on the importance of political stability, commitment and good governance and the importance to um, have this commitment over the long term uh, if we want to de deliver on the sustainable development objectives. Um, that would also meet investor demands, um, Yosef said. Um, governments and regulators in the countries uh, need to work with all the other stakeholders, really, to support the development and the offer of green financial products by local uh, financial institutions, because they would bring in, this would be the most immediate way to reach the, the, the right stakeholders. It would also be a way to bring in the kind of information and data and understanding of the local context and of the, uh, the clients that these institutions have uh, and that the others that are coming from uh, overseas would probably uh, 
um, be lacking. Um, the development of long term, this was something really interesting that uh, Yosef uh, mentioned uh, and emphasized in his presentation, the need to establish, to develop long term sustainability and green regional financing funds. It, all, it was also uh, something that Prasun, I think, mentioned. So again, one of these things um, coming up again uh, and uh, being reinforced by different speakers. Um, the need to develop incentives for agriculture to, to um, adapt green practices. This is really fundamental. Um, and uh, Yusuf said, like we had incentives put in place by um, lots of countries um, to incentivize the use of renewable energy, we need to be doing the same also for agriculture and food. Um, and it's a kind of reasoning that is very difficult uh, not to agree with. Um, then uh, there was mention of the continuous support for the need for continuous support for digital transformation um, for many reasons, amongst which also to improve the transparency and the reporting on impacts and so on. And also another aspect that came out of the discussions by several of the speakers was on the role and the potential that value chain financing arrangements have um, for reaching the smallholders. Uh, this is also another very important area that could perhaps be um, explored even further uh, in the future. Um, the role of the public development banks, uh, as Claude mentioned, can be extremely important um, as a way to deal with the market failure that, with respect to the, what the commercial banks right now and the funds can do, especially in developing countries. Um, and he also mentioned the need, the, the, the need to identify and properly characterize what really constitutes sustainable and green and green practices. Of course, the financial service providers will be looking for that to make sure that, and not only them actually, to make sure that um, they are indeed making an impact and they are, they are indeed driving and channeling, channel, channeling resources to where they should be going. Now, this is what I had noted down, but of course the discussions were far richer than that. Um, the time is, is limited, so I would stop there. I would thank Bettina and all the contributors very much for the excellent uh, discussions. And um, let me just say that um, what we're going to be doing tomorrow, I mentioned that, uh, that at the beginning, but uh, here it is again. Uh, there, we will start with technical session three that will consist of three parallel breakout sessions, each focusing on innovative solutions for green finance um, across designing investment products to mobilize funding from market investors. Then we'll have another group on developing projects and pipelines for accessing existing funding sources. And the third one will be focused on how do we improve the enabling environment for green finance by addressing policy and, and, and regulation structures. The participants will be um, allocated randomly to three breakout rooms for this. Uh, and the discussions will be moderated internally in each group. The last session will be a SAFIN session. I want to emphasize that. Um, and it is open only to SAFIN members. So what will happen is that our SAFIN colleagues will be sending out a new link um, through which you can connect um, those that are um, the relevant colleagues you know, who are members of SAFIN can use this link to connect for that final session. Bettina will be the master of ceremonies uh, accompanying us throughout the day tomorrow. Um, and I think um, at my end, I have concluded. I hope I haven't uh, forgotten anything important. But uh, from me, um, uh, from myself, and also on behalf of our team, um, I wish you a good evening or a good morning, depending on the area of the world uh, you are in. And I hope to see um, everyone um, energized and ready tomorrow again for day two of the workshop. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, I, yeah, I don't know if you, Bettina or Michael or some others have anything to add. If not, we close it there. I don't speak for Michael, but I think uh, we, we probably close and uh, we just resume the conversation tomorrow. Uh, Michael, did you want to say anything? No. I just wanted to thank everyone. This was really an excellent session and thanks for your great participation and uh, all the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.